Hi. I'm talking about uh, overcoming challenges of uh, service integration on SOCs. So Synaptic uh, is a company which is focusing on high-speed service IP, and over the past uh, years, we have worked very closely with our customers to integrate our IP into their test chip. And this is basically a summary of the learnings that we have had. So this diagram shows how a service looks like in an SOC. So typically, an SOC would have an I.O. ring around it. And what I've shown here are flip chip bumps. And then there is an, a, a digital core. And I've shown an example where there are uh, two sets of service IPs located. And of course, the sizes and the bump sizes are just representative. On the right, I am showing a real uh, four-channel service example. Uh, this is our 28 nanometer uh, TSMC 28 HPM CERDIS. And uh, so this, this includes uh, four channels of receive, a PLL, and four channels of TX. The TX is a bit smaller than RX in area, so uh, that's how it looks. So in an SOC, uh, uh, the uh, the CERDIS also includes its own ESD, which integrates in the SOC I/O ring. Uh, going forward, uh, this is how a CERDIS IP looks like on the inside. You have multiple transmit lanes, where the parallel data is serialized and driven out on the serial lines. In the middle, you have the PLL and the common biasing blocks. And then on the other side, you have the receive lanes. On the SOC side, we deliver a PCS soft macro. And uh, the register bank, which does the configuration of uh, various parameters of the CERDIS. And then there is the IEEE 1500. I'll, I'll cover these blocks and the integration of uh, these blocks. So uh, as far as integration goes, uh, there are various checkpoints which I have labeled here. So on the SOC interface side, uh, you have the PCS soft macro, which takes in the data uh, from the controller or the upper layers and passes it on to the CERDIS. On the DFT aspect, you could have an IEEE 1500 or a JTAG interface to test the IP. Then uh, a service is uh, something which talks to the external world. So there are pins, and there are aspects related to physical design and package design. On the physical design side, there could be aspects related to halo or keep out away from the sensitive analog portions of the service. Then there are power supply related aspects uh, to be, cons uh, to be uh, thought of. And then there is ESD and bumps. For clocking of uh, these IPs, so these are very high speed, uh, very jitter uh, sensitive IPs. So the clocking and the uh, clock reference clock design for the CERDIS is also one uh, very critical aspect. So uh, in the following slides, I'll cover uh, these aspects one by one, and then I will show how uh, our IP has solved these as uh, problems or tried to minimize the things which can go wrong at the SOC level. So on the SOC interface side, the, the SOC would have a digital interface to the service. So what is, what is very important is the accurate description of all the pins and the register views of the IP. And at a service which runs at 12 and a half Gbps has a very fast interface, even at the parallel uh, data level. We can, we can slow it down to half or a quarter rate, uh, but it, it still has a it has a fast parallel interface, so the timing arcs uh, to the service from the SOC are uh, to be looked at. And a service IP typically includes a lot of analog. So there is the other aspect of the quality and uh, uh, functional checks. So uh, there is this aspect of how accurately is the analog modeled. And uh, when you go for accurate simulations, uh, the simulations and SOC verification can be slow. So there is this trade-off of accuracy versus speed of simulation. So I'm showing how 
we at Celeptech develop our uh, service IP. So the blocks in green are blocks which are developed uh, in the digital flow, and the blocks in uh, yellow are the blocks developed in analog flow. So uh, this uh, this IP can be built, the FI or the service can be built in an analog top flow, and this is an this is an approach taken by uh, quite a few companies, but we don't do that. Uh, the, there, are, there are several problems associated with this flow, and uh, most of these cause issues uh, at SOC integration time. What we do is we wrap around the analog with a digital, and that entire top level of the IP is built in the digital flow. There are several advantages of that. So. It, it enables the use of standard digital flow for IPQC during development. And most of the times, that is what is being done at the SOC level also. In fact, it could be the same set of tools which are used for implementing the uh, digital of the SOC. And the models and the views that are delivered to the SOC are also produced by the same tools and the same flow. And there was this aspect of uh, high-speed time enclosure at the uh, FI and SOC interface. And so again, during the, during the implementation of the IP, we constrain the SOC interface path to just consume 20% of the time, and the remaining is available to the SOC. Again, this constraining and checking with the constraints is possible because we do this IP top in the digital flow. And we have a methodology to build the IP from a specification which can be read by our internal tools. So the, especially the pins and the register descriptions, we provide the pins and the description, and the direction, and the power domains of the pin in the form of a spreadsheet. And the IP is built using that spreadsheet. So that, that is the view which is shared with the customer, and that is the view which is used by our scripts to build the interface, to build the boundary scan, to build the register banks. So what is shared as documentation is exactly what gets implemented. And the, the other advantage of using this flow is uh, we again can use the script-based flow for verification. So all of these aspects which are documented in the spreadsheet are verified uh, again by uh, scripts. So this is a specification-based top-down design flow. And basically, it enables a very good quality check. And it allows us to efficiently implement what we are documenting. So on the physical design side, uh, there can be requirements from the IP to keep out the noisy blocks. and there could be definitions of halo around the IP. So th that is something that the SOC integration needs to bother about. On the power supply, uh, so on the power supply side, there are concerns about EM and IR on the power input to the SOC, uh, or to the IP, I'm sorry. On the, on the ESD protection side, uh, the, the IP, because it talks to the external world, it has to meet the ESD uh, guidelines and the ESD spec. And once that integration of ESD cell is done, we need to have the integration checked out, uh, especially the resistance of the ESD paths. And then there is this other aspect of the bump and pad placement. So these are very high frequency IPs which are very sensitive to parasitics. So any bumps being placed over the IP can cause parasitics to the circuits underneath. So that is something that needs to be taken care of. So the way we build our IP is we take care of all the sensitive circuits by placement, and we surround them with, uh, uh, with a halo internally, and we minimize the keep out regions that the SOC needs to take care of. The power grids are built in, and static and dynamic IR drop models are provided to the SOC. So this is, again, a very important aspect. Although the IP has a lot of digital, we do not leave the power grids to the SOC. We build the power grid on our own over our IP. And the, the reason we do that is, I'm sorry. So the reason we do that is 
because the, the timing analysis needs to be done with the power grid being present. So our ST is closed with that and the power, power pins are always available at the edge of the IP. So this is a snapshot from our integration spec where, uh, where we show how the power grid is to be hooked up and uh, how, we we, how we require all the pins to be hooked up. Again, the, the service IP itself includes ESD protection. Uh, if, if we validate the IP on a test ship, we also do ESD testing on that IP. And to check the, uh, the ESD integration on our IP, uh, we have our internal flows to check the resistance of the paths and the ESD parameters. And the IP itself includes bumps and the routings completely inside the hard macro. So the SOC does not need to place the bumps and route them. So this takes care of two things. So the SOC need not bother about uh, what parasitics uh, are critical to the CERT is. And from the IP quality point of view also, we have, a, we have a known presence of the bump and the bump routing, and we extract and simulate that. So next comes the as aspect of uh, package design. So the third is routings. They are extremely parasitic critical. So these routings need to meet uh, various specs. Mostly they are insertion laws, return laws, and uh, skew related requirements. And many times there are very few layers in the package. Typically, it's just four layers. So a lot of routings are packed in a very small space with very critical routing resource. And a similar situation exists on power supply and ground planes. The package needs to provide very low resistance and inductance to the power supply. And with, with fewer layers and many uh, channels of a CERT is packed together, so there is a scarce routing resource. There is the other aspect of uh, sharing multiple BGA balls. So if, if you have multiple lanes of a CERT, each one cannot get its uh, isolated power supply. You need to share the power supply bumps to minimize the pin count of the chip. So that aspect needs to be taken care of. So in our IP design flow, we, we, we start working with the packaging team of the SOC very early in the cycle. And the way we do that is we provide the, the IP port uh, S parameters as the S2P files for the SOC to directly simulate and verify that. So the SOC packaging team can directly start working with the standard, and they know how, how the termination of our IP looks like. And all they have to do is simulate their part of the design with the standard spec. And uh, this is a snapshot show, uh, from our integration spec where we, where we illustrate how multiple IPs can share the package balls. And what we do is we specify the parasitic uh, constraints on these paths that the packaging uh, designer needs to meet, and what is the limit on number of IPs that can share the balls. So this is done early on. And uh, regarding crosstalk, so our IP inherently has all TX channels on one side, all, all receive channels on one side. So this inherently minimizes the crosstalk at the near end. So that's an NEXT near end crosstalk. On the DFT integration, uh, so the IP can have a JTAG interface or a IEEE 1500 interface for uh, DFT. And uh, many times, uh, the SOC can use the other interface, so there is a mismatch possible on there. Then, uh, because the service has pins on uh, uh, external uh, to the chip, so integration of uh, the AC JTAG and DC JTAG has to be done. Then there is this aspect of testing the analog content in the CERDIS. So typically, analog requires trim or uh, even analog uh, quantities being measured. And that, that amounts to test time. So that is a concern. And then there is a concern of coverage, meeting coverage goals with the analog present. So I'm outlining the DFT architecture of our CERDIS. So we use the 8-pin IEEE 1500 uh, DFT interface. And uh, this is something that can be easily plugged into a JTAG tab at SOC level. And there are, there are ways we can do that. 
and the entire APB register bank of the IP is accessible again via IP1500. So in any of the test modes, the IP configuration is possible through IEEE 1500 itself. So there is a bridge included from IEEE 1500 to APB inside the IP. And then the digital part of the CERT is supports a plug and play uh, scan test. So the test interface of the IP simply needs to be mapped to a GPIO and the wiggle patterns that we provide can be run on the tester. And as far as the analog testing and the test time goes, so all of our analog is tested with BIST. So it, it allows using a low cost tester. No analog quantity has to be measured on the tester in production. This, reduce, uh, this reduces the test time and uh, for, for enabling this, we also deliver the test benches to uh, uh, exercise each of the BIST modes. And then uh, the IP itself supports the AC and D DC JTAG, uh, which is the boundary scan. So we deliver the boundary scan description language uh, pre-validated uh, view. And that particular interface is proven with standard JTAG tab controllers. So on the clocking aspect of the CERT is so there are, there are two main things. There is the reference clock for the PLL and the routing of high frequency clocks. So the reference clock from the PLL for the PLL needs to be a very clean clock for most of the interfaces. In fact, uh, interfaces like PCI go on to specify the jitter on that clock as well. And then there are, there are concerns related to the routing delay and jitter and the coupling. And pretty much the same concerns are present for the high frequency clocks which exist in the service. So the way this is taken care of is by integrating a reference clock buffer inside the service IP. So this is typically done for most of the PCI Express interfaces where there is a 100 megahertz clock to be taken in from outside. But this can also be done for uh, several other standards. So this reference clock buffer is contained inside the service and this routing is contained, in, co contained inside the service. So this is pre-validated and simulated by us. On the high frequency clock which comes out of the PLL, so this clock is also contained within the service and connects to the channels by abutment. So this is something that the SOC does not need to route. And then there's this aspect of the timing at the interface from the digital side for the SOC STA. So to enable that, our IP internal clock tree is available in the dot lib itself. So this is, this is a big table. This is just a summary of all the different views uh, which are delivered with our IP to enable the integration of the SOC. So uh, I'll just quickly cover some of them. So the, the specification is something that we deliver in the document and the spreadsheet form. On the, on the, on the physical model side, uh, we, we also deliver the, I'm sorry, yeah, on the, on the physical model side, the extracted initial extracted timing model is also generated from the spreadsheet and delivered on the on the stuckat and dft patterns we deliver the wiggle files which can be run directly on the tester and for the analog test we develop uh, we develop the test bench and share it with the soc team so in summary so service integration involves a lot of aspects like we like like we have seen and some of these aspects require early planning and co-design like the package design for example and DFT and timing are the other aspects which depend on the IP development methodology. So I, I've just shared some of the features and our methodology that enables us to ease the integration at SOC level. Yeah, so th that uh, that's the end of my slides. Uh, I can take any questions. Any, any questions for uh, Ravi? Well, you can uh, find a Soloptex, uh IP catalog on chipestimate.com. What's the typical uh, BGA size for the package? Uh, for our IP or the SOC? The SOC for the service. The BGA pitch are you asking yeah. about? Yeah. Yeah, so the BGA pitch is typically 0 0.65. And uh, we go to lower pitch also, but uh, then it is limited by crosstalk concerns. Any other questions? Oh, fantastic. Thank you so much, Robbie.